It is an absolute pleasure to be here. This is one of the most exciting conferences to be at to see technology and how it can be applied. And what I'd like to do today is to show you some un anticipated discoveries that we made in translating a technology that we've been developing and presenting to this conference for quite some time. I have a little bit of housekeeping to present first though. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about human clinical data. It's generated under um, a combinational drug device, an IND, an investigational new drug, phase one, phase two, that's sponsored by the University of, of Texas Health Science Center and it's funded by um, the National Institutes of Health. There there are probably conflicts of interest you should know when I'm discussing this and that there are interests that the, um, that the investigators may have in a UT Health Science uh, startup. Um, just to get started here, just a brief review, I think everybody knows about near-infrared fluorescence. It starts out with the idea that one uses a near-infrared fluorophore that can be conjugated onto a targeting moiety, whether it be an antibody such as shown here, or a peptide which targets a diseased tissue. And the idea is, is that we take a near-infrared light around 780 nanometers, very dim, illuminate the tissue, that near-infrared light propagates through several centimeters of tissue, excites that fluorophore, and then that fluorophore basically re-emits a fluorescent photon. Now why this is so exciting is that that fluorophore will be able to be re-excited after it decays. So a lifetime of a fluorophore is on the order of a nanosecond, so you can imagine that would be almost a billion photons per second that's emitted from a single fluorophore. Compare that with the gold standard of nuclear medicine for the PET or a SPECT radionuclide where there's one photon ever that's collected. And in Houston, if you fly, or if you, if you fly, if you drive around the 610 um, fr loop freeway, you see all these um, billboards about PET and SPECT imaging for cancer imaging. And I think that near infrared may have that opportunity to be a, 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 a molecular imaging modality. But when we first got started, there were no um, fluorescent molecules that had a conjugatable group. Now they are. And in addition, there were no near-infrared detectors. And what we did is we borrowed the night vision technology from the first Gulf War and adapted that for um, near-infrared fluorescence imaging. What you're seeing here is 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 a result, it was not something that we really wanted to do. NIH, or I'm sorry, FDA, required us to validate our instrument before we put one of those first in humans agents in. And so what we had to do is we had to put a floor for, dim floor for, endocyanin green right underneath the tissue. And our goal was to get that floor for to be taken up by the lymphatics, streamed through the lymphatic vessels, and deposit in the lymph nodes. And our goal was to actually see those lymph nodes after a microdose of this endocyanin green. Well, we succeeded. We saw those lymph nodes about four to five centimeters deep. But what we really saw, what was really striking, is these lymphatic vessels. And if we play the movie, if you would click on it, we would because of the high photon count rate, we could take 200 millisecond images and, and, and put them together to generate a movie of lymph flow in humans non-invasively. Why is this important? Well, the lymphatics is kind of like an important circulatory system that's kind of forgotten. It's responsible for fat absorption, for picking up excess fluid uh, that's leaked from the vascular compartment. And it's also important in the immune surveillance. And when something goes awry with the lymphatic system, terrible things happen. And in fact, the next image here is an image of a gentleman with very subtle lymphedema. That's an edema formation. And what you see here is the arm. You see this normal lymphatic bundle. And if you would click on it, we can show the motion. But you see these new vessels, lymph vessels, formed by the process of lymphangiogenesis, kind of similar to blood angiogenesis that the tumor um, uh, metastasis people try to target. This is the first time that it's really been imaged non-invasively in humans. And this is lymphangiogenesis, the drug target of Genentech down the road here in Imclone, where they're trying to prevent lymphangiogenesis to inhibit the metastasis of cancer. If, you, if these diseases, the lymphangiogenesis, lymphatic diseases get worse, what you actually see is a worsening of this aberrant um, uh, architecture of the lymphatics. In fact, you don't see any flow. You see very fine torturous vessels um, on the surface and deeper vessels that tend to slowly transit um, 
um, uh, the dye. And in fact, we see that there's a, compo a population, a rare population, that actually has a genetic predisposition for acquiring these lymphatic al abnormalities after cancer surgery or a trip or a sprained ankle. And in fact, some people are born with lymphedema. This is this fluid accumulation owing to lymphatics that don't operate properly. This is the foot, and this is our imaging as performed. You can see we've rejected the excitation light, so we had a dot the surface. This is the foot of a diseased person with very subtle symptoms, and this is a normal foot with the with the straight lymphatic uh, uh, vessels that propel fluid. Now, what's interesting about this is that this disease of lymphedema um, costs centers of Medicare and Medicaid a significant amount of money. And with cancer survivors, the number of cancer survivors increasing, cancer survivors are very susceptible to, to this disease of lymphedema after they get their lymph nodes removed for nodal staging. And so what we're looking at is trying to understand if we can detect very subtle disease and see this early. Well, it turned out that we can find rare families with this disease, and this is one that's located here, um, that, are, that have this rare disease that have the phenotype, this is the swollen legs or the swollen arms, that's common in cancer survivors. And what we've done is we've used the lymph imaging to actually phenotype very accurately because for example, these two sisters have normal parents by just by looking at them that they don't have these phenotypes. But when we image them, we find that the mother actually does have a phenotype because she has aberrant lymphatic vasculature. And what we've done with that is we've taken these very large families and a few of them at this point in time, and we've done um, some next generation sequencing. You know, we can we can sequence the whole genome, but for um, in order to do a therapy, we would like to know is what proteins are, are have have mutations associated with it. So we've done next generation whole exome sequencing, and by just sequencing the one to two percent of the genome that encodes for proton, proteins, maybe we can find a druggable target um, for preventing or treating this disease. And so we've done that with these families, and I don't have enough time to talk to you an awful lot about this, but if this is the lymph endothelial cells that line those uh, lymph vessels, we find a number of mutations in common pathways, which suggests to us that we may be able to prevent um, or even cure the disease if we need to do an awful lot more. But I want to point out one, one protein that we just recently published on. This is a protein that's encoded by a gene called RASA1. It's a P120 RAS gap that's a negative regulator of the MAP kinase pathway. And it's been associated with um, aneurysms, um, capillary malformations, and no one's ever thought about it in terms of the lymphatics. Well, this gene actually pops up in the human population studies, and what we've done is we've taken this and we've created an animal model and knocked it out. Now if we can dim the lights and if we can basically start the movie here, Sun Kwok Kwan in our laboratory basically did some lymphatic imaging in mice. Lymph don't have an awful lot of lymphatics. And what you see, this is the body of the animal. An injection was done at the base of the tail. You see the inguinal lymph node. And if hopefully you can see it, it's hard because mice don't have as many lymphatics as humans, but you'll see the the trans of the lymphatics to the axillary lymph node. Now if we hit the image on the right, this is an animal that has a conditional knockout of RASA1. Look at that phenotype. There's no other phenotypes associated with that protein, knock, that, that, the, the gene knockout, other than what we just saw here. So these are the earliest phenotypes that we can see, and it's kind of similar to what we see in the patient population. So what I'm trying to point out to you is that when you're translating a new technology, um, it's, you can learn some things that you, and you can do some things that you didn't think you could do. Uh, for us, we were actually phenotyping a rare disease that gives us some indication of some more common disorders. We use that phenotype to accurately find the genes that may be causative for disease, and then we go back to the small animal model to knock out that gene and confirm it again through the same imaging that we've done in the clinic with the idea that we'll be doing drug discovery. We can discover new targets from diseases and do it accurately because without this phenotyping, the genotype would be lost.
because we would mistakenly associate a normal person with a diseased person and lose the association between the phenotype and the genotype. So my final slide is, well, you think you've gotten from the bench to the bedside, but you really have to go back again too. And that's where the discoveries are going to be made. Thank you very much.